Hi, this is Daniela Cambone and welcome back to the Daniela Cambone Show. Well, my guest today may be a professor of organic chemistry by day at the prestigious Cornell University, but he is also known uh, quite well in the economic circle. He's an avid writer on Zero Hedge. He's a podcaster and uh, he loves getting into controversial topics. And that's why I couldn't wait to bring him back on today. Please welcome to the show. I'm not going to call him professor because he hates it. No, so, Dave, I hate it. Yeah, Dave. You hate it. So, but, but, but people are going to say, Daniela, you're being disrespectful. You're not calling him professor. Anywho, Dave Collin. So good to see you. Uh, it's great to be back. How many times have we done this? Maybe four? Uh, you know what? This, yeah, three or four. Yeah, I think you actually hold the position of having the highest click count of all my, of all my podcasts. I, 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 I am aware of that. And I feel the pressure to keep that pole position let's see <laughs> oh, if we can got beat it, it right now um okay we're obviously going to talk finance because like i said obviously you are a chemistry genius but some including bob moriarty who if you're in the gold industry you know bob moriarty have said you are the greatest investor of all time <laughs> what's the backstory with bob well, I had to pay him a lot to say that. Um, Bob and I go back so far that you wouldn't know it because I once sent him something and he posted on, on 321 Gold. His site. Um, and I was, uh, I was, I, I, it was posted uh, pseudonymously as Thomas. I used to post on websites as Thomas, which is my son's name. So there's people who go back to the Prudent Bear chat board 20 years ago with Doug Noland and, and they know me as Thomas. And, um, and, and, and at one point he reached out in earnest several times he has, and then, and then we've just been connected since. And somehow he's adopted me. Um, and, and, and he, he, he's been really helpful and I don't quite know why, but. Um, and, and, and we're going to get into why he thinks you're one of the greatest investors. We're gonna look at what makes up Dave's portfolio but first, since you are also an academic, Dave, I thought we'd start with this news headline from this week that now nearly 153,000 student loan borrowers currently enrolled in a new repayment plan launched by the Biden administration are, are getting an email or already got an email notifying them that guess what? Their remaining federal student loan debt canceled. 1.2 billion in total. Your thoughts? Well, I think Biden's treasonous. How's that? Let's open. Let's open soft okay. and, and then right. get into it deeper later. Okay. Okay. He he doesn't have the power to do so. The Supreme Court rules he doesn't have the power to do so, and then he did it again. So, what do you do with a president who who ignores the Supreme Court ruling? And the you know they can't just sit on his shoulder and watch him twenty four seven. So he goes and does it again. What the hell is that all about? So, so I think Biden is the worst president in history. I think everything he does is treasonous at this point. Now, I'm not, I'm, I don't think I'm being metaphorical. I mean, I think he does stuff that really undermines the very existence of the United States. So, so and that's one of them, you know, just ignoring the Supreme Court. I think bigger question, right? Like I said, as an academic, at one of the most expensive and prestigious schools in the nation, should school be this expensive? No. Should no, but be it's an arms. It's an no. It's an arms race. So many, many years ago, the schools were much simpler. So we have huge. We have a huge bureaucracy, but the bureaucracy is brought on by our connections with various governments, and so that's created all sorts of connections. Um, and things that you have to do as a school that that um, you didn't have to do before. You worked out of a shoebox, right? So you asked the feds for research grants and they didn't seem to care about the details and everything was easy. Now it's not. And now with the whole DEI stuff, there's just all sorts of things going on. Now, with that said, we do have too many deans and too many administrators. We could cut way back. But what's also true is there's an arms race between schools. So if you come to Cornell and we show you lousy dorms and you go to Princeton and they show you brand new dorms, where are you going to go, right? So, so, um, so I would have to say that that arms race is probably a consequence of, you know, bad monetary policy for 40 straight years. And so it is yet another bubble. I, I once talked to a, I can, I 
keep forgetting his name, but he's a Cornell economist who's known for his, his expertise in college finance. And he said the golden era of academia is over. He, he, I had him in my office and he, he said, I think it's over. I think we've, we've seen the peak and it's downhill from here. And, and it, there's also going to be a rich get richer, poor get poor. So if you look at some place like Princeton, which has an endowment, I'm going to throw out a wild guess of 50 billion. Cornell's is probably 8 billion. Princeton has a f- small fraction of the number of students. So there, so, so, so places like Princeton, now Stanford, because of Silicon Valley, Harvard, of course, you know, the, some of these schools are, have enormous sums of money. And so it, it's a bidding war in which we're going up against, you know, John Gotti and, and things like that. So Cornell is also much more diverse than those other schools. So Cornell is ranked number one in one critical category. Number one in the nation. We have more top 10 ranked departments than any school in the country. We have 57 top 10 ranked departments. Now, the problem is that is expensive to keep 57 balls in the air at one time. When you say we've reached peak academia, just elaborate a little bit there. I mean, do you think that we're moving toward, we're we're placing less importance on holding a degree from a Cornell or a Harvard or a Yale? We will. We're not there yet. Um, I, you know, there's stats from years ago that show that if you, instead of going to college, an average college degree, you, you become a UPS driver. Based on the average earnings of a college degree versus the UPS driver, but the law, the expense of the four years, the lost earnings of the four years, um, the break-even age is around 56 or 57, where the college graduate finally crosses the UPS driver. Now, forget the UPS driver, become a plumber, electrician, you know, something that's actually a skill group. You'll, the co- average college kid won't catch him. There will be people who far surpass him. Now, the other thing about colleges in the old days was is that, you know, that they were places where rich kids went for the most mm-hmm. part. They were sort of upper middle class and upper class. And, and, and as a consequence of that, um, you could study anything you want. You didn't have a payback issue because, you know, it, it was stupid to study some, some, something that would not extinguish the cost of the college education, right. but you could afford to do it. Um, Nowadays, it's so expensive. You go to Cornell, you major in some subject, which I'm not going to mention because I don't want to piss off the art squad. But you, ma- you, you major in something that for which you can't identify an obvious revenue stream, right? If you come here and learn how to make robots, you're going to do fine, right? But if you come here and you study something out of the dusty archives, you're never going to extinguish your loan. And, and here's an interesting stat, Cornell's English department. Now I'm about to get in trouble. Cornell's English department, tenure track and tenured professors. Um, It's a department that at one point, one could argue had a real sense of purpose because everything that gets written has to be written by somebody, right? All the journalism and everything, but that's going away fast. And there are 46 faculty. That's a big department for, 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 for something that chat GPT is about to take out at the kneecaps. Ouch. Well, to your point about how it was for rich kids and getting back to Biden, this is a quote from his message. He says, from day one of my administration, I vowed to fix student loan programs so higher education could be a ticket to the middle class, not a barrier to opportunity. Well, I would say it's not been a barrier. If you want to go to college, you can go to college. What it has done, it's created a mess that I don't know how to fix. And that is we now have, what, 1.5 trillion in student debt. So Biden's correct in, in addressing this problem. But there's, there's people who busted their chops to pay off their loans and to, to go to college. And so there's a fairness issue, which you're never going to get rid of. So if you all of a sudden just start extinguishing loans, you go, oh, you who you're charging me taxes to pay off those loans. It's a very difficult problem to fix because some 18 year old did agree to pay off the loan and you go, well, it's, it's an 18 year old, you know? So, so I, I have solutions going forward, but I don't have solutions going backward. Want to talk economy now with you and okay. whether the U S consumer has hit a brick wall. 
crash landing, if, if you may. I want to pull up an article from the Wall Street Journal that it says it's been 30 years since food ate up this much of your income. The last time Americans spent this much money on their food, George Bush was in office, Terminator 2, Judgment Day was in theaters, and CNC Music Factory was rocking the billboard chart. So we get it. The consumer is, is under immense pressure here. But we keep get being fed the headlines that it's not. Your take on consumer confidence here? Well, I think if you ask the consumers, they will give you a different answer. There is not, the, the consumers are not enthusiastic, right? The polls of consumers say everything hurts. Um, the CPI numbers are, of course, total garbage, right? So the problem with that is things that are inflation corrected, therefore, become total garbage. I can make the case numerically that we've been in a recession for years, that we have been in a shrinking economy for years by using the right inflation numbers because the GDP is inflation corrected. So if you correct it for a stupid number, then you're gonna get a 3% GDP if you correct it for the right. And you know, people talk about shadow stats, but they've kind of beaten down John Williams. And so, so go to the Chapwood Index, just search Chapwood Index, a guy named Batowski, looks at 10 cities, 500 purchasable items in those 10 cities. And he just monitors those 500 items, the cost in these 10 cities. And it, it, the, 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 the inflation rate has been running, I would say over the last uh, 30 years, it's been running about 5% above the CPI by the Chapwood Index, which means all those 3% GDP prints were 2% mm. negative GDP prints, really. So, now, what's with the consumer? Well, the consumer got handed a wad of cash and they, they, they partied like it was 1999 for a while. And it was somewhat legit because life sucked. I mean, life was really miserable during COVID lockdown and stuff. And so there was, a, there was this sort of relief binge spending. The numbers seem to show that they're out of money now. The numbers show that the credit card debt is starting to really ramp up. Once you start spending, it's, it's very hard to cut back there's a stickiness to a spending habits. It's like the person who's fat. Look at me. Um, stopping eating is not easy, right? I mean, it becomes sort of a muscle memory, as Bill Fleckenstein would say. It's kind of a muscle memory. It's very hard to stop habits. And so that's why, you know, employees are not being laid off yet because the, the, the employers are reluctant to give up that employee who they fought hard to get back after COVID. But I think the layoffs are going to start. So I think I think we're really, I think we're heading for a disastrous <laughs> period of time say, that's both depth and length. Does the Fed know the real numbers, what you've crunched? They obviously do. Well, one time Greenspan got asked a question by, I don't know, Ron Paul or someone that was a kind of a question he wouldn't want to answer. And he says, we know what you know. It was one of these, we, we, we know this sort of non-stated, these non-stated truths. And so, so green, the, the Fed couldn't be so collectively stupid as to not know their inflation numbers are off. And everyone has a different inflation number. I don't have a mortgage, so I'm gonna have a different inflation number than someone who has a rent or a mortgage, especially an adjustable rate mortgage, or especially a new mortgage, right? There, there's just, so my inflation number is the cost of taxes, my inflation number is the cost of food, the cost of something my wife buys off Amazon, you know, but that's kind of it. And, and someone else's inflation number is going to be a different, different slice of the pie. So we all have different inflation numbers and, and, and there are people, here's what I don't understand. You recall uh, probably half a dozen to a dozen years ago, they would say, you know, that half of the country can't put together $400 in the event of an emergency, right? That was a, a very standard line. Well, if that number was true, that half now is thousands of dollars underwater because, because inflation, Jimmy Ioria, I, I, I overlap with him a ton for some mysterious reason. There's people who I see all the time. I've been to five meetings with Danielle DiMartino Booth, right? In what universe does Dave Kalman, and Danielle DiMartino Booth have that kind of overlap? <laughs> um, it turns out that Iorio, who owns a restaurant, has a great read on the cost of food and mm -hmm. supplies and stuff. And he says, now the number he's quoting is over the last three years, 
That's not the inflation they're talking about. So what's your take on rate cuts and what they're really going to do here? I mean, we saw the 60 minutes with Powell, but now we saw the Fed minutes coming out, which were more hawkish. I mean, what do you think? Where do you think the truth lies with what they're going to do with the with the rates? Well, so I think the ball is in Powell's court completely. So he is the new Greenspan. This is not a democracy inside the Fed. I think Powell ultimately makes the call. By the way, I'm going to make a prediction. Brainerd is positioning to be the next one. Um, Powell, the, the, the million dollar question, and I've stated in public with flanked by famous economists who disagreed with me, but that's never bothered me. Um, I think Powell is way more determined than people are giving him credit. I think if you look at Powell, people say, well, you know, he works for the banks ago, but Powell's also an aging guy who's thinking about legacy and thinking about Jerome Powell and thinking about the Pantheon. Is he going to be in the Pantheon Mm -hmm. with Arthur Burns or is he going to be in the Pantheon with Paul Volcker? Mm -hmm. So I think Powell may be much more serious about inflicting pain. He stated it clearly several times. Then he seemed to waver, but I was talking to somebody, he said, you know, if you listen to what Powell said, he didn't say I, he said the Federal Reserve Board. So he was kind of conveying the sentiment of the board. But if his, he's the decision, that might be an irrelevant statement. And so we will find out if Powell is determined to get control. Now, I also think inflation is one of the two things that must be bugging him. The second is that as of this morning, the markets are up to the Nasdaq's up 2% because NVIDIA beat numbers that they set. So here's a company that's trading at 40 to 50 times revenues. And, 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 and they're, they're dictating the entire course of the market now. Powell can't be looking at that going, oh yeah, this is good, I'm comfortable with this. I think Powell's second equally important concern is how does he deflate the speculative fever, the speculative bubble that has grown because of their actions. Now, I have the markets at 100 and, I don't know, 50% overvalued. That means a 60, 70% correction to get back to historical fair value. And people like to say, well, how do you know it's going to get back to historical fair value? I go, I don't. But if they don't get back to historical fair value, they're not going to get back to historical returns either. Because if you pay... 35 times earnings, you're, you're paying for 3%. Let me, let me throw this out to you. The perception though, right, to the general public goes, the stock market right. is ripping. Everything is great. Right. So would he really want to deflate it? Because eventually it ends up in tears. I've been saying this on Twitter for the last couple of weeks. There is no example of an overvalued market that didn't eventually return to fair value, if not lower. There's no example. It's sort of like saying there's no example of a currency that didn't eventually die. It's a truism. So so Powell's sitting there looking and saying, this thing's got a 70%. uh, Great example, stupid examples. Microsoft is 10x over the last 10 years. During that time, their revenues grew 60%. 10x grant gain on a 60% revenue growth which is basically inflation, right? And, 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 but it also means that five of the 10X, 5X is expansion of valuation. Valuations always eventually contract, always. When? I don't know. So how, well, well, to your point of when, I don't know. I mean, to your point that he wants to leave this legacy, well, if it doesn't happen during, during his tenure, does he care? I mean, how close are we to that bubble bursting in equities? Well, Arthur Burns, no, he'll get credit. I mean, we'll hang it on him. His legacy will be determined by whether or not the next Fed chair has to wrestle with it and gets to blame Powell for leaving a mess. How, how's the legacy of um, of um, that hobbit? Um, what's her face? Um, come hobbit. on, name her. The previous Fed chair. Me... Janet Yellen? Yeah, the hobbit. Um, how's her legacy doing now, right? Nothing happened on her watch that was bad, but her reputation is pretty much squat. Part of it's because she did nothing. She did nothing to fix it. 
what's Ben Bernanke's reputation for you? Uh, for me, it's low. For me, it's low. But I'm probably in the minority. Here's the I problem I have so. with Bernanke. Bernanke is said to be the world's expert on the depression. Mm -hmm. To someone with a walnut-sized brain who has paid attention to the history of markets and history of credit bubbles and stuff like that, the 1929 to 1941 period was caused by a massive credit bubble created in the 20s. If you look at everything, the 1930s was just a correction. He always blames Fed policy in the 30s for blowing it. They blew it in the 20s when they let a credit bubble explode. Bernanke, I'm going to say this, Bernanke does not understand the depression or he's a lying piece of crap. There's no way that the depression was caused by the 1930s. It is the consequence of, of the 1920s. Congress was having, Congress, I've read Federal Reserve minutes from the 20s. They were having a cow over the bubble and what to do about it. The, 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 the Congress was having, was, was having hearings on the speculative fever in 1927. They knew problems were coming. So Bernanke, when he says, oh, the mistakes were made in the 30s, it's conceivable, you know, there could have been some, okay, we didn't have to let the cascading failure occur. It did some damage. But the correction of 30s, if you look at a 1900 to 1950 inflation adjusted plot of the markets, you can see the blow up of the bubble. You can see the collapse of the bubble. You can see it then march off as though nothing happened. The 1920s was the bubble. The 1930s was the correction. The 1930s, by the way, was according to Robert Gordon, the period, you know, there's, a, there's two types of, of, of inventions, according to Gordon. Gordon wrote a brilliant book, something about wealth creation in the title. He says there's the primary one, electricity and our plumbing, you know, the internet. Then there's the secondary ones, which are the spin-offs of that, like appliances and Microsoft Word, and, you know, you know, Google, whatever. Um, and, and he said the 1930s was the best decade for secondary inventions. During the Great Depression, we created tons of wealth, but we we're correcting a credit bubble, massive consumer credit bubble. When you have a consumer credit bubble that bursts, no one has any money to buy anything. So let's wrap this point with what you, how you started it. When you said you believe that the recession started long ago. So if we're already Good. in it, mm -hmm. where do we go now? What happens? Well, at some point, the markets finally figure out, someone finally figures out that inflation is going to ramp up again. This, this, this multi-phase inflation run that's yeah. now a pretty popular plot. And I think, uh, I think Roach put it out first, maybe Larry Summers jumped in quickly um, and, and repeated it. Now it's everywhere. I think that's probably true. And I think Powell's terrified of inflation getting a grip on um, inflation, getting a grip on the system again. He's worried he's going to make the same mistake that Volcker actually made, in which he tried to let up on the break. And all of a sudden it took off again and he had to hammer it even harder. And so I would have to say that um, I would have to say that at some point inflation is going to box us in such that the Fed can no longer become just a just a free money. The phrase there's no free lunch is true. So, so the economy grows, this will shock people, but if you ask guys like Howard Marks and stuff, the economy grows around 2.2% a year over the last 150 years, the real GDP. And, 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 and so if you wanna grow out of a bubble, you can do the math to, to, to go from, you know, 150% overvalued and say, let's just let the GDP keep growing. Eventually we'll just kind of absorb the bubble. Yeah. That's 50, that'll take 50 years. I want to talk uh, U.S. election because it will be interesting to see how the monetary policy, you know, evolves during this election year. Uh, but what do you think for you will be the top three issues uh, in this election? I know you've been tweeting and there's no shortage of, of issues. Opinions. But for you, what are the top three? Top three issues. One, is the election legitimate? It doesn't even matter if it is or it isn't, if half the country doesn't believe it. And they can't run it in a way where you can say, look, beyond a doubt, it's legit. I, I can't complain based on what I saw. If we get to the end of the election, like the last one, was it fixed? Was it not? I could express my opinion. It's very strong. 
Um, but, but, but the fact that it's not knowable because it was run so poorly, because it was run in such an unorthodox way, left half the country saying, this is not a democracy anymore. If we fixed that, we'd get back on our feet and say, okay, we're good to go now. Uh, I think that's the first issue. I think there's a lot of issues that are not gonna be things that people talk about on the podium, but the, the voters are worried about. I think, uh, I think the weaponization of the Department of Justice is what I call treason. What a lot of people are watching going, you know, I, I, I think it's pathetic that because you don't like Trump, you're okay with the justice system being used to beat him senseless. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I think you're a pathetic, intellectually deficient person if you can't see past your hatred of Trump to recognize that it is a terrible moment in history where they're using political appointees to, to, to levy $363 million fines on fabricated charges. They want to bankrupt him. They want to bankrupt him. He's, he's a leader, leading presidential candidate. No one lost money. He did, he, he, JP Morgan testified that his estimated values were signed off by them. There's nothing about the story. And then some judge who really needs a bad beating um, charged him $363 million. That, that is authoritarianism. And I think, I think at some point we have to stand up to that. And that's a crisis that's not been seen since 1861. Most people think that, you know, they have a playing card they haven't shown yet and that they're going to take out this star candidate. Maybe it is Michelle Obama. But does it not just come down to Michigan, Dave, and... Who could beat Trump in Michigan? I think Trump could win 45 states if they counted the votes. I, I, Biden is truly, truly awful. He can't put together a coherent sentence. When Putin did his interview and he did 15 minutes of history, and everyone said, oh, what's Putin doing? Stalin. What Putin was doing is showing a juxtaposition of his capacity to be coherent on detail for 15 minutes compared to Joe Biden. That's what I think Putin was doing. And, and now so, today Biden called him an SOB. I don't know if you saw that. Right, online. right. I've written in favor of Russia and the Ukraine war. So I'm really a contrarian on that one. Um, but, 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 but Biden, they can't put him in front of a camera. They can't put him in front of children. They, 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 there's, 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 there's now guys coming out saying, I've got, you know, 17 hours of tapes recording of, of the Burisma scandal. These are all, Biden has committed more crimes than any president, and that includes Clinton. And I think that's a crime family. I, I, I don't put them high up on the on the. So so so, I, I don't see how, I, I don't see how you can possibly vote for Biden. You could vote for him because you hate Trump that much, and I do understand why people hate Trump, but I don't think they're actually. I don't think they're. They're not looking at Trump. Trump's policies. What, what did They're you, hating the man. Did you like? Did you like RFK? Do you like? RFK yeah, I'd vote for RFK. Well? Yeah, I do. Yeah, 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 yeah. If 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 the Democrats sucked it up, said let's go with RFK, I'd vote for him. Wow. And 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 if they don't suck it up and they put up Kamala, I won't vote for her because I think she has the IQ of a walnut. I think I think she's got the IQ of Joe so, Biden. So. Okay, so you want a fair election. You don't want the weaponization of the justice system. Let me go out on a whim. The third for you is not the weaponization of the dollar? Well, I've, they've already blown that, in my opinion. That's already gone. I, I, think, I, think, I think the weaponization of the dollar, and Putin said it brilliantly. You want to be the reserve currency yeah. and then you steal assets, right? That was yeah. so stupid. But I also, I don't, I, I don't buy the res, the whole model of reserve currency. Uh, why why aren't reserve currencies? And I got a good answer from Lynn Alden, who you should interview mm. if you haven't. Yes, um, yes, yes, many times. You need to be able to write contracts in a currency. So that's what the reserve. But but to, you don't need a reserve currency to store money. There's a million things you can, you can store it in a basket. You can store. You, I can sell you something in Zimbabwe dollars. A microsecond later, convert them to Japanese yen. 
So you don't need this big pile of dollars everywhere. And, and people are talking about the BRICS and how, oh, that'll be a stupid right. currency that'll never get likes. The BRICS, is, the BRICS is not about a currency. I don't think that people talk about the BRICS and currency have it right. The BRICS is about a fundamental shift in alliances in the world. You've got 20 countries, including Arabs, saying, we're going to go with Russia and China. You take the BRICS seriously. That is a fundamental. You're, yes. you're watching them and saying they mean business. Well, not just that. There are 20 countries saying we're not aligning with the United States now. We're aligning with Russia, China, right? India. Yeah. This is a revolt. All right. Let's get to Dave's portfolio. Like I said, he's uh, well respected by many in the investment community. And every year you put together a year in review. So you did your 2023. You've been doing that for 13 years now. Mm -hmm. And you give a rundown of how your portfolio did. Um, of course, I'm interested in the gold and silver part. But for the folks new to you at home, tell us a little bit about what you like, given the current world we're living in. How do you feel protected? Well, so where I feel vulnerable hmm. is that um, in a bull market time is your friend and in a bear market time is your enemy. And right now it's acting like a bull market, but I'm a bear. So they're basically burning the clock on me. If this thing would finally get off its butt and correct, then I would be offered opportunities to, to buy assets at what I consider to be reasonable prices. Right now I can't. So, um, so I'm, I'm hunkered down for the apocalypse. I have a huge sort of cash position, which is, you know, two-year treasuries, but that's cash. I think it's going to be long and protracted. So I think we're the Nikkei is probably the best model. A combination of the Nikkei and, and the U.S. 1967 to 81, so raging inflation and a, 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 an equity market that can't get off its butt. I think that will be what takes investors down to the studs eventually, a very long, protracted, tedious period of malaise. It's not going to be, it's not going to be a collapse because the V-bounce buyers will be in there fast. You have to, to, to really correct, you have to knock investors on their butt, have them get back up, knock them on their butt again, have them get back up, knock them on their butt again, and eventually they just stop getting up. That's the bottom. And, 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 you know, 1929 to 33 was a V-bounce. The Nikkei is not a V-bounce. And if monetary policy is handcuffed by inflation, then they can't trigger V-bounces the way they have been doing for 40 straight years. So I think, I think time is going to be the enemy of, 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 um, of the investor. Time scares me more than price. So uh, I got some crap from a very famous European money manager who has been very supportive. And he said, I think you've lost your edge because you're worried about all this other crap. I got about a five or 6% return last year. I will take five or 6% all day long if I'm actually hedged against catastrophe. So if I can get five or 6% while being totally protected from what I fear is coming. Oh, that's spectacular. My best decade, I had a, Typically good decade, the 80s. You couldn't not make money in the 80s. I had a great 90s because I was actually a tech bull, believe it or not. I, my best decade compared to everybody else on the planet was the knots. While they were getting hit with two bear markets, I made 13% a year for 10 years compounded. The, the teens up to the present, I sucked because I believed we were not done in 08, 09. I believed we had another halving in front of us. What I didn't see coming was $30 trillion. I could not have, uh, do you know anyone who said yes, I knew they'd spend that much money? No, <laughs> no. Not even. When, they, when they gave us 700 billion, it was, it was breathtaking. <laughs> right. When they bailed up Bear Stearns for 30 billion, it was breathtaking, right? So I don't think anyone, including the Fed, knew that that was in the system, that that could be done. But I don't think they can save the next one. Why do you like gold? <laughs> is that a is that a rhetorical question? Um, I like gold because because I think it will do. Okay. Gold's compounded at seven and a half percent a year since seventy one. 
It's actually not bad, right? Um, you know, people always talk about gold, you know, an ounce of gold bought up buys a good suit. That's a stupid metric. Because, I know. Because, I hate that metric. Well, but, well okay, I'll tell you why look. I hate it because you don't know what a toga costs, right? <laughs> but I'll tell you the other it's metric just... that you should use. Yeah. Gold also bought a month's worth of manual labor in Rome. It's about what Meaning? it buys now. Well, manual labor is ir irrespective of history. Well, I was going to say, if the complete system fails, right, is gold your only salvation? Well, then, well, uh, well, I own my house. It's an expensive house. And it's appreciated a lot, but it's an expensive house. And so I have, I have a place to live in. Um, I have a lot of gold. I have treasuries that, that I'm constantly battling the real inflation rate. So people say, I'm making money with 5% return on treasuries. No, you're not. But you're not getting crushed. Right. But they're, they're rotting my portfolio. So I, I, I would love for this, for this correction to start in earnest. And I have some strategic changes that I've made since the, I was totally cashed up for, for 08, 09. I was positioned perfectly except for the fact that I just couldn't believe it was stopping when it stopped. I thought, oh, no, that's a head fake. Do you have exposure to crypto? No. Why don't you? I, I, so no Bitcoin for you. Why? Well, well, first of all, I'm kind of a Luddite. It's a, it's a digital asset. It's, it's got a, I don't like having to worry about that sort of level of tech. Beauty of gold. I have an ounce of gold, right? I mean, that's... Uh, Straightforward and, and a mutual fund is simple, right? Um, crypto is a little weird, and and second of all, I do believe that at some point crypto is going to do battle with the state. Period. Well, battle the state. Well, you know the whole gold versus Bitcoin debate has been renewed on fire now because you know Bitcoin hit one trillion with the advent of ETFs. Everyone's saying, look at the outflow of gold ETFs moving into the Bitcoin ETFs. Well, let me ask you this. Did GLD help the gold market? I don't think so. I think it absorbed demand that would have gone actually at the gold. But instead, I don't think GLD is backed by gold. I read the prospectus. It was like, we'll have some over here. We'll have some over there. It sounded awfully right. fractional reserve to me. So I think GLD was put into place to A, make someone some money and B, to absorb demand. Right. Well, that's why you want to own so physical the, gold. Right. So the, so the crypto ETF is, is absorbing crypto into the normal world, which I think is a loser. So I think the crypto guy should not be enthusiastic about the ETF. I was watching Max Kaiser the other day, who's, who's, who's certainly visible in that world. Um, who's that? Talking. Yeah, who's that? Right. Who's that? Um, he, uh, I've done some podcasts with him. We get along. Okay. Um, talking about how the ETF is going to hurt people. And I, I think that I think the serious Bitcoin guys are going, you got to have your own codes. Don't be exposed to counterparty risk. Right, right. And that's and so I think they're going to do a battle with the state. You watch Christine Lagarde or Yellen and they occasionally say things that are kind of shots across the bow saying at some point we might hurt you. At some point, they're going to try, in my opinion. It is after that battle, the battle of Hastings, you know, the battle of the bulge where I'm going to assess whether they want or not. You mentioned Lagarde. We didn't even talk about central bank digital currencies yet. We might have oh, to save yeah, it for no. another time, but... It's a nightmare. You should never support it, period, QED. It's a nightmare. Uh, is it a great reset for you? It's authoritarianism. I, I think you can understand much of what's happening in the world right now if you start reading books on authoritarianism. So you're reading Hannah Arendt, uh, uh, Eric Hoffer, uh, Matthias Desmet, uh, you read about uh, uh, Michael Malice has a great book on the Soviet Union. And if you read about authoritarianism, you go, oh my God, that's what's happening. That's what's happening. We covered so many topics today. Yeah, and I tend to do that. Some of our best conversation was not on air, but you gave me some really good parenting advice. Let's end on a happier note here. Um, cause you did right. a great job raising your kids. I like how you were saying you got to pick your battles when it comes to parenting. I just want to, if you could share some insights of, of what you, what you think worked with raising your, 
your kids? I mean, did you push them? Did you want them to go to Ivy League schools? Well, you kind of want them to, but you, that's not a choice yeah. you get to make. Um, and so, as I told you, my older son was a disaster through high school. And I, he was really terrible. I mean, he applied to one of our really weak state schools and got rejected. I mean, he really was, he really was terrible at school. And then he kind of slowly grew up as he went through a two-year associates program and then another, finished a four-year program. And as I said, he's now the director of event management at the Council on Foreign Relations. And he's an extraordinary parent, extraordinary parent. I mean, I'm, I'll wake up at you know eight o'clock when they're visiting and he's already out with his kids on a hike somewhere. <laughs> you know, he really is an extraordinary parent. My younger son was a super achiever. You want to know super achiever? Super achiever is a kid who, when he applies to college, fifth in the nation equestrian. Wow. Gold medal in the eight state regional gymnastics championship. All state orchestra in New York state and played lacrosse. Wow. He got to college and got lost. I go, what? What? And then he found his way and he tried the cubicle farming. He got a business degree, he tried the cubicle farming, didn't work for him. And now he's a professional violinist. And I'm about to go broke because he's heading off to Europe to shop for an Italian violin. And it's gonna be on the bank of dad. Go figure, right? Go figure. You, well, you, you never get out from underneath right. that burden. Yeah. So, <laughs> so now I'm very proud of my kids, but, but the, the advice I gave to you is do not let your household turn into a war zone because they're not living up to what you want them to be. I you, love you that. Kind, you kind of got to let them be it. And they're, they're going to, they're going to tell you, uh, there's a famous, there's a, a YouTube by a guy. I can never remember his name. who talks about how he break children. He talks about this, this case from the 1940s where the woman takes her daughter and she said, the daughter won't sit down, the daughter won't stay still and the daughter's bopping around and the psychiatrist is talking to her. And he, he says, he says to the, the daughter, he says, I wanna to talk to your mom for a minute, do you mind? And the daughter says, yeah, sure. And as he walks out the door, he turns on the radio and plays music. And, and in the modern era, we drug her, right? And the guy walks out and he's talking to his mother. And he says, look at your daughter out there. She's dancing around. He says, your daughter doesn't have a problem. She's a dancer. And she became one of the great choreographers. You have to figure out what they are and then find a way to let them be that and maximize it. And boys will not learn to read until they're about six. And it's okay. And, and, and it's okay. My son was in, my smart son was in remedial reading. There were 28 kids, there were 28 boys. So they're totally. Morons. There you go. You know, your next project, because you don't have enough on your plate, you need to write a parenting book. I would read that, Dave. Well, you know what I was going to do? I was going to teach a, we have freshman writing seminars where we give unlimited numbers of topics and you'll learn how to write. Chat GPT. I was going to teach one. And it was going to be on personal finance. Nice. But then chat GPT showed up and I said, I can't even teach him how to write because I'm just going to get a bunch of computer print out. Yeah. And I just lost all interest in teaching the course. I still like to teach personal finance. Um, and it, as a freshman would be a good time because it might say, you know, note to self, majoring in sociology might not be the smartest move. You know what? One day I want to come visit you at Cornell and I just want to sit in on one of your lectures. You have a standing offer to join me on my deck. Yes. Burgers, bring your kids, bring your husband, bring whatever. Yes, yeah, standing <laughs> offer. And famous people have been on that deck. Famous people have been on that deck. People okay. Have up. And so illustrious people. One day I, one day, I had a couple of guys visit and I didn't even know who they were. And I have to pretend to my wife like I do. And these guys show up. One's, one's, one's a Citibank bond trader and another I can't remember, but they could have shown up in a tie-dyed Volkswagen bus. And I said, yeah, sure, come on over. And I cooked cool. them steaks. and I'm going to take you up on that and we'll film it. Oh, you'd, all you'd right. Know the peop you'd know the people you'll be following onto my deck. You would know them. <laughs> if I mentioned names, you'd know them. I'm sure. All right, Dave. Professor Dave. 
Um, you are <laughs> you are great. And we will see you soon. And I know we covered a lot of different topics. And that's why I always say to people, we have a Calendly link under our description. You can set a call, a time to speak with one of my uh, colleagues at ITM Trading. If you need help navigating the topics or want to set up a strategy. And don't forget to sign up at DaniellaCombone.com to stay on top of all this great content. We will see you soon. That's it for me. Bye.